was our first reunion after Fred and I were married. Fred's ship had been transferred to San Diego. I'm speaking of Fred Young, U.S. Navy. I'm Ann Young, Fred's wife. Our first reunion. Yes, and our marriage was so new that the name Young was still awkward and strange to me. This was during the Korean action. The Navy had warned us that there was a housing shortage. But rather than be separated from Fred, I'd taken the train to San Diego and arrived the same time his ship did. Our first port of call was the Navy housing office. A member of the housing staff told us of the various housing projects. As we'd been warned, Navy-controlled housing was unavailable and would be for several months. Until a unit was available, we'd have to stay in a private home. My education as a Navy wife had begun. As I was to learn, the ability to adapt quickly to a sudden new situation was to be an important part of my life. We settled on a rooming house close to the base. It was no palace, but it looked clean and neat. Budget conscious, I wondered about the rental. It was good to learn from Fred that his basic allowance for quarters would help pay the expense. The landlady was sympathetic and pleasant. It suddenly struck me that this was the real beginning of Navy life for me. We were in a Navy town. Fred and I were together and alone, but it was a life I was looking forward to. Like most young wives, I was interested in my husband's work. That he was part of something as big and complex as the Navy only served to increase my interest. So with Fred's help, I learned a great deal about the Navy about the different types of ships, and about the rank and insignia of Navy personnel. While we walked, Fred also told me something about the Navy's history. I've always taken a quiet, patriotic pride in my country, and it made me even prouder to learn something about Navy ships and personnel. These ships and their crews, I realized, sail to all parts of the world. Our Navy, as nothing else could, told the nations of the world of the power and greatness of my country, the USA. A month or two later, I was lucky enough to go on a day cruise arranged for the wives and older children of its personnel. able to see our husbands at work, giving us a clearer idea of their specialized duties and how they were an important part of the ships of our Navy, the Navy that gives our country its sea power. Later, the housing office notified me there was an apartment available in a Navy housing project called Public Quarters Number Two. This was another first for me, my first contact with Navy sociability. I already knew from Fred about Navy humor. While the manager was opening the door, a Navy wife came up to him to register some minor complaint. Then she asked if I was moving in. When I said probably, she said I'd like it there, welcomed me aboard, and offered to help me in any way she could. This was my first meeting with Carol Freed, a chief petty officer's wife. Carol was to become my best friend, a lifelong friendship somehow typical of the Navy.
I looked over the apartment and found it attractive and pleasant and decided to take it. I was happy with the new apartment. The only trouble was that three days before we were to move in, Fred's ship sailed. His destination was secret, but there was little doubt in my mind that Fred was heading for Korea. Like Fred, I didn't have the slightest doubt that aggression in that area had to be stopped. This didn't keep me from worrying about Fred, what was happening to him and his ship at this moment. Later, I read how UN forces had completely blockaded the Korean coast, denying the communists use of the seas. Coastal bombardments and airstrikes from our carriers, as well as helicopter rescues of downed pilots, all helped to stop the communist aggression. My thoughts were interrupted by someone at the door. At this lonely point, Carol and two other Navy wives dropped in to welcome me to the quarters. Cheerful, friendly people, I quickly warmed up to them. It was a relief to know that Carol and the others were just as worried as I about their husbands in combat. But they had sensible and comforting reassurances. They knew, for instance, that the U.S. Navy has the utmost concern for the sailor as an individual. This doesn't mean that Navy men are pampered, but it does mean that they're given the best equipment and training, which results in the safety and well-being of the individual sailor. We discovered that our husbands were on board the same ship. In fact, that Carol's husband was Fred's CPO. This got my friendship with Carol off to a good start. During the weeks that followed, I did many of the things Carol and the others had suggested. Writing cheerful letters to Fred was one of them. They turned out to be morale boosters for me as well as Fred. I began prettying up the apartment, figuring that the more I made it mine and Fred's, the better Fred would like it. Worthwhile reading, knitting, and sewing took much of my time. interest, I noticed the quiet, sure way Carol handled herself and those around her. Calm, easygoing, and good-humored, Carol also was energetic and sharp-witted, qualities that enabled her to handle almost any problem. Her qualities reflected in her children, who were bright, friendly, well-mannered, and helpful. In another way, they were reflected in Carol's husband, who, by just knowing Carol was in command of any problems at home, made his morale high and his seagoing duties easier. During this time, I discovered, with Carol's and the other wives' aid, various Navy fringe benefits. The commissary, for example, the Navy exchange, and the station movie. For my spiritual needs and guidance, I regularly attended the station's interdenominational chapel. I was finding the pattern of Navy life. Through my friends, I now knew of another important aspect of the Navy, that it was composed of warm, friendly people, always willing to give someone else a helping hand. Sooner than I dared hope, Fred's ship returned. Needless to say, I was there to meet him. And then Fred was with me. Korean conflict over, there was a good chance Fred would be home for a while. His air group had completed its carrier tour and was now based ashore at North Island. With this good chance in mind, we bought a car. In it, we took advantage of some of the recreational facilities. Swimming at the beach. And tennis. On a Saturday or Sunday, we sometimes visited a Navy club. 
much of our leisure time was devoted to Fred's studies, which would set him in line for promotion to petty officer second class. He'd begun to study on board his ship and was now boning hard for the soon-to-come examination. I knew he wanted the promotion, so I not only encouraged him to study, but also helped him in whatever way I could. Fred got his promotion. And I was very, very proud of him. One morning, a couple of months later, Hey, what's the matter? Nothing. Now look, there's something wrong. What is it? <laughs> Just don't feel well, I guess. Well, can I get you an aspirin or something? Well, I don't think an aspirin will help very much. Don't worry, honey. I'll be all right. Now, look, there's something wrong. What is it? I think I've got morning sickness. I'm going to have a baby. A baby? You? We better tell somebody. Uh, uh, Carol. Oh, Fred, no, it's too soon to tell anyone. Oh, too soon, for sure. Uh, uh, oh, gosh, honey. Oh, gee, you're wonderful. <laughs> we both are. <laughs> During the next few months, my routine changed considerably. There was a registering at the Navy Hospital and frequent routine visits there. I noticed that many people showed me extra courtesy. And, of course, Carol and the other wives were cheerfully concerned about me. Fred, naturally, was especially attentive and helpful. Fred also had re-enlisted. We talked it over, and he decided to sign up for another four years. There was Fred's pride in the Navy and in his job. There was the uncertainty of civilian life. And there was the coming baby. Then suddenly the blow fell. There was no secret this time as to where Fred was going. To Little America to help set up a base camp which would later be used by a group of scientists on an expedition that was to be known as Operation Deep Freeze. It was more than likely that Fred would be down there when our baby was born. And that was a little frightening. I found it easier if I kept myself busy, useful, and cheerful. That Fred was thousands of miles away was unfortunate. But I was proud of the special work he was doing. The least I could do to keep him from worrying was to show him I could take care of things at home. Just before the baby was born, I received a late, late telephone call. A call that was unofficial Navy, yet very typical Navy. Mrs. Young? Mrs. Van Young? Yes, who's this? Jack Tupper here, Mrs. Young. I'm a ham radio operator, and I have a message for you from Operation Deep Freeze at the South Pole. I am Mrs. Young. Go ahead. Okay. Here, you take it. Look, um... Well, tell her Fred wants to know if anything happened yet. What kind of a question is that? Look, ask her if it... It has to do with a baby. A baby? Mrs. Young, Fred wants to know if anything has happened. Well, tell him not yet, but any day now. She says not yet, but any day now. Look, um, 
You tell her I love her and I, I wish I was with her. He loves you and he wishes he were with you. Tell him I love him too. She loves you too. You know that she loves me too? For a long time after Tommy was born, it seemed I did nothing but change, wash, and hang out to dry a never-ending stream of diapers. Actually, a lot else happened. A highlight was the baby's christening, attended by Carol and her husband and several other friends. Carol became godmother to Tommy. And to our great pleasure and pride, Fred's division officer became godfather. Another wonderful thing that happened was that Fred, by hard study, some of it while he was at the South Pole, became a petty officer first class. One thing, however, hadn't changed, the car. But it was still running, and it would have to serve us a little longer. For with Fred's increased pay, we decided to buy our own home. There was a feeling of security in the idea of having our own house. It was practical, too, for if Fred were transferred to another station, we could always rent it to another Navy family. We looked at several places, but we especially liked a house in a pleasant nearby suburb. So we bought the house, using Fred's reenlistment bonus we had saved for the down payment and financing it through in-service FHA. For a long time, Carol had been talking about the Navy Wives Club to which she belonged and had urged me to attend a meeting. One day, I got curious and went along. Before the formal meeting, I met and talked with many of the individual members. I was greatly impressed by the backgrounds and interests of these women. They were leaders not only in Navy life, but in the community as well. Mrs. McCloskey was the president of the local PTA. Mrs. Maisel led a Girl Scout troop. Mrs. Wright had organized and taught at a nursery school. Mrs. Benton worked with a group of emotionally disturbed children. I joined the club and have never regretted it. Partly influenced by the Wives Club, I broadened my horizons. With Tommy, I went on many of the club's organized outings. To the local zoo, for example. To the beach. And on excursions to nearby points of interest. I also interested myself in club charity activities. The wives prepared layettes, for instance, for distribution to new mothers at the hospital. At the same time, officers' wives collected clothes for Navy relief shops and for orphanages in Korea and elsewhere, and served at Navy Relief Society thrift shops. Needless to say, the years that followed brought with them their problems and joys, some of them peculiar to the Navy. Fred was transferred, and for a time, we lived at Alameda, renting our house as we'd planned. Carol and her husband also moved, but had returned recently to San Diego, where they bought a house close by ours. Soon we returned, and our friendship picked up just where it left off. But somehow, friendships never need renewing in the Navy. They're always there, warm, undemanding. Of our problems, there was a time, for instance, when Tommy was five years old. like any normal boy of his age, was either screaming with laughter or mortal pain. Never, it seems, anything in between. The big naval hospital where Tommy was born gave me a feeling of confidence, knowing that in a few minutes he'd be in the hands of competent doctors and nurses. Yes, and knowing, too, that after Tommy was fixed up, we wouldn't have a big medical bill to worry about. Doctor had seen Tommy several times before, and they got along well together. He said Tommy would be all right. He'd need a couple of stitches and a tetanus shot, and they'd taken an x-ray to be certain there was no fracture. Did I want to wait outside while all this was going on? 
once, perhaps, I might have been squeamish about staying, but not now. Not after years of being a Navy wife. Tommy needed me, needed my comfort. I'd stay with Tommy. While they got him ready, I thought about those years. Tommy stood up to the medical treatment like the good little sailor he was. And by evening, he was playing baseball in the backyard with his friends as though nothing had happened. Despite my outside activities, the bulk of my time I devoted to my family and to my home. For, like most Navy wives, I firmly believe that family is the cornerstone, the foundation of the Navy way of life, of the American way of life. If it is strong, it reflects in the well-being and morale of Fred and the other men of the Navy. In whatever corner of the world they are, whether on exercise maneuvers or on policing action to stop communist aggression, their job is made easier by the knowledge that back home is a strong, self-reliant family unit.